Hello, I'm Min Jung Kim, Director and CEO of the New Britain Museum of American Art, one of, if not the oldest museums of American art in this country. I'm delighted to welcome you to the opening of our exhibition, Jennifer Wen Ma, An Inward Sea, an ambitious project that is part of our new now series featuring contemporary artists. Based in New York and Beijing, Jennifer Wen Ma is an interdisciplinary artist whose projects have been presented worldwide for institutions including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Qatar Museums, and the National Art Museum of China, among many others. She has produced and directed the internationally touring opera, Paradise Interrupted, and in 2008, Ma was on the creative team for the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics and received an Emmy for its US broadcast. Her work explores themes of utopia, dystopia, and the human condition in immersive and participatory installations. Ma's site-specific exhibition for the New Britain Museum of American Art and Inward Sea continues this exploration while reflecting deeply on the events of last year, including the COVID-19 pandemic, extensive shutdowns, and subsequent racial justice uprisings in the United States, and how they have impacted the lives of local residents. Presented in the museum's William and Bett Bachelor Gallery, an inward sea transforms the gallery into a dreamlike space, featuring a luminous moon projected above a glistening cut paper sea. Throughout the exhibition, the moon sets a poetic stage upon which the portraits of local residents are projected, accompanied by their recorded stories of anxiety, trauma, community, and perseverance. These audio and video recordings culminate in a personal and collective history for the city of New Britain and for the New Britain Museum of American Art, capturing the momentous events of our time and our journey towards healing. This installation marks the final exhibition of the 2020 20 plus women at NBMAA initiative, celebrating the invaluable contributions of women to the arts while increasing representation of their work at the New Britain Museum of American Art. On behalf of the New Britain Museum of American Art, I extend my profound gratitude to Jennifer Wen Ma for creating this meaningful, timely, and inspiring exhibition, which explores human resilience in the face of tremendous adversity. We sincerely appreciate the invaluable team of exhibition collaborators, including oral historian Nisa Chow, members of the production team Lance Kamau James and Philip Fortune, as well as Jennifer Wen Ma's entire studio, including Jean DeBias and Olivia Saparuto. I would also like to thank local residents and workers who participated in the exhibition by sharing their stories of the last year and contributing to the Inward Sea Oral History Project. This exhibition is part of the museum's 2020 20 Plus Women at NBMAA initiative presented by Stanley Black & Decker with additional support provided by Bank of America. This exhibition would not have been possible without the generosity of our sponsors, including the Sai Foundation, the Benzor Group, Dr. Peter and Grace Yu, and the Howard Fromson Endowment for Emerging Artists. Finally, I would like to thank our talented and dedicated staff, as well as our board, volunteers, members, and community at large for your commitment and for supporting the museum's success. And now I am pleased to welcome our featured artist, Jennifer Wen Ma, to speak about her work and her current exhibition, An Inward Sea. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual opening for An Inward Sea. My name is Jennifer Wen Ma, and I'm the artist for this exhibition at New Britain Museum of American Art. It is such a pleasure to be here with you because like everyone, you know, I've also been in quarantine in a pandemic lockdown. And this project really rose out of this time I spent by myself with my two cats in New York, um, thinking about this time that we live in and what tremendous energy we've spent to overcome this um, adversity we've 
our world has phased. And one thing became clear um, when I began the conversation with the museum again on the exhibition going forward with the exhibition was that I wanted to create a space where a collective of people, community can come together and reflect on the time that we've had in the past year. So the result is this exhibition called An Inward Sea. Um, it is composed of several components. One is um, the anchoring would be the black sea made from paper that covers the museum floor. And the tip of the wave is dipped in gold to catch the light as if it's under the sun or city lights or moonlight. And countering that are two pendulums swinging in midair. They are out of sync with each other, yet at times they will sync up as if they are swinging in tandem. I feel like this is kind of the relationship I've had with other people in the world. There's a physical distance that I've noticed with another human being more than ever in my life, whether it's three feet apart, six feet apart, 20 feet apart, nothing at all. Um, we're just so acutely aware of our physical space. So these two glass sculptures, one black and one white, represent this dichotomy that we live with. Um, the yin and the yang, the light and dark, the push and pull we see all the time of these um, intense isolation we feel sometimes, but also there's some closeness we've um, created with our community, with our loved ones. I think we've all felt that in the past year. We've reached out to people we probably normally wouldn't, even though we cannot be with them physically. So these two sculptures really stand in about the relationship that we have with each other um, against the Black Sea of this terrain, this new landscape that we are all collectively or individually traversing through. And the third element of this show was um, probably the last piece that came together. Um, I had this idea of the seascape early on in creating a platform, a place of contemplation of um, a, a reflection of the landscape or seascape. But I felt like I really wanted something that can draw in the community, draw in the, in the individuals um, and people and voices. And it took a bit to crystallize. And I really took my time to figure out what that part might be. And to this, I'm really grateful to the museum team. Um, the director, Min, and curator Lisa, they never rushed me. The whole team just said, take your time. This is an unprecedented time that we're living in. It takes time to really absorb the time that we're living in for something really profound and interesting that could come out of it. So it took a while, but what came to me is just that. It's people's voices. How can we go beyond the statistics and the numbers that we see and hear every day? I feel like that's all we hear are just the numbers ticking up or going down, these graphs that we look at, but what about the people? And given that it is a global pandemic, there's probably nowhere, no corners in the world that hasn't been affected by it, but yet we're individuals, right? Our experiences are singular, they're unique to us, and depends on our age, where we're from, where we live, our stations in life and our perspectives, we're gonna have really a set of very complex um, experiences that um, we've gone through. So this last component is oral history um, of people in New Britain, in the surrounding areas. I collaborated with oral historian and interdisciplinary artist Nisa Chow on this, who has been really instrumental in help shape this portion. Um, we conducted a series of interviews that are not typical interviews that you have. I have a set of questions I ask people who come in, but rather it's a conversation. What Nisa says is creating a place where people could be the author of their own stories so that they, we are here to hold the truth for them, with them, and reflecting it back to the world. And that's what I try to do. Um, 
we had conversations, there might be a prompt or two, and really starting from the pandemic, what was the experience like? We often started with the question, what was the first moment you knew something was different? And what was that moment for you? What do you remember of that moment? So maybe it's something you can think about too. Um, when did you know that 2020 was not gonna be the same as years before? And from there, the conversation went to all different places. And I'm just so grateful for all the participants in this project so far, in that they really opened up their hearts, their stories, their histories. Um, we have a, um, someone who remembered working with the kids that she works with at, um, at her work, seeing the fear in the kids' eyes and remembering what it was like when she was a very young child sitting in the living room with her parents and when John F. Kennedy was shot. She did not understand what was happening, but in the fear that she experienced through her parents, she knew something bad had happened. From there, she, this person could think about her kids and think, well, what can I do not to pass on this fear to the kids I work with? Um, we have, um, someone who went through the COVID experience herself, so that becomes very visceral to her. Um, we have um, folks who um, remember back to their native country who have uh, moved to the U.S. Uh, later in life, what it's like to have been through a revolution and held a gun in their hand, but yet said, what am I doing? Put down the gun, how do I make my life better so I can make a true difference, and how it relates to not only the pandemic, but also the social uprising in the last year with um, racial awareness and all this has been happening in our country. So people just really went far and wide in these conversations in where their memories led. And I think that is going to be evident in the richness you see and hear in the stories that are told in this project. Um, so above our glistening black sea, there will be a projected moon. Um, in the moon is a series of silhouetted profile faces of people talking about their experience in, in the past year. Um, and I hope in hearing this, in thinking about this, you may want to participate as well. So please reach out to us, to the museum, if you would like to also take part of um, oral history recording. It's a record of our time that we live in. It's a record for the city, for the museum, for the region, and for humanity, how we come together. What is um, this time? What does it mean if we don't record it? How do we um, tell it to the future, tell it to our children and the next generation? And what do we tell us ourselves 10 years from now, 20 years from now, as we remember back? So it's just a really um, beautiful testament to the human spirit. And um, we are, um, I think of my work as a way of pulling together all different kinds of materials and experiences to create really unique, singular, um, experiential, aesthetic experience for the museum goer, for the visitor. Um, I don't think of my work as residing in necessarily material, whether it's this sculpture, this paper, or even necessarily a video or storytelling, but that when you're in the space, um, if I'm able to tap into a universal core that we all have within us, somehow create a little bit of a perspective shift or seeing something that you haven't seen before, thinking about something in a way that you hadn't thought before, that little click or shift or something that happens within you, I think that's where art resides. So I hope um, you will continue this journey with us. Um, look at the website, see the images. If you can visit us, please come to the museum. The show is open through October 24th. So, um, please come see this work for yourself or experience it online virtually. Thank you so much from friends far and wide and near and friends old and new. I'm really, really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to the museum 
to allow me to do this project and share with you that rises out of the pandemic. And um, that's it. I don't think we, uh, we as a society, as a world, I don't think we're, we're, nobody taught us how to be alone. I think we're afraid to be alone, right? So then when something like this comes, which is a, basically it's a pandemic of isolation, right? So when something like this comes along, you're forced to be with yourself. Now, in the era of checking the cell phones all the time and, and being distracting and, and uh, you know, it's almost like the whole environment is against uh, uh, self-reflection or quietness. This is a generation that actually saw for the first time in, 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 in their lives someone being murdered, killed on television. That impact is not going away. It almost reminds me of my dad, who was from the South, uh, who actually witnessed a lynching that stayed with him the rest of his life. He was seven years old, and actually. And you don't lose that stuff. You learn how to deal with it. I'll tell you, frankly, there's certain days I'm happy to be masked, so I can just move in and out. <sighs> it's hard not to, like, harbor any ill will towards people who don't understand that side of the equation. You know, some people will think it's maybe, oh yeah, no, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I know people who've had it and they've been fine. And then you get the stories from some of the, you know, healthcare workers like my husband that are, you know, really gruesome and really tragic and horrible. People dying, you know, in pain and, and alone. And it's like not a pleasant, <laughs> it's horrible. I remember when I was a kid, um, the night my, I was sitting with my parents and John F. Kennedy was shot. I remember that when I was a little girl. And um, I remember seeing the fear on my parents' face. And I didn't really know what was going on, but I knew that something bad was happening. And I was scared. And I remember that to this day. I'm 62 years old. I'm almost 63. And I remember that to this day. It was just you can feel the fear in the air. And I think that's what it was for the kids. They knew we were scared. They knew all of a sudden it was like, shut down, call your parents, let's go. I typically have 35, 37 students in a classroom. They don't turn on their cameras. Now, you could, naughty, naughty students, you're not turning on your cameras, but there's all kinds of reasons because they didn't choose this online venue. They may not have a camera. They may not have the bandwidth to use a camera. Uh, they might be in a situation where they're not dressed appropriately or they're in their bedroom, which they share with somebody else, and they don't want you know, the, the camera. So there can be all kinds of reasons why they're not using their cameras. So as faculty members, we can't insist that they use their cameras because we don't know the reasons why they're not. You have to be respectful of, of their choices. Going into 2020 in general, um, I had a grandma that unfortunately passed away, so it was a hard time for me to come in. And since it's happened in March, it was like just around my birthday, like I would say 11 days, 11 to 8 days, somewhere around that to my birthday was. And it was just a really hard time for me to adjust in general. I'm telling you, 2020 sucked. I loved, I had waited forever to live alone again. I have two, I've had two husbands and three children. And the last time I lived alone was like 1969. And so I was great with this. So I could write when I wanted, I could paint when I wanted. Um, it's a very small town. Um, I live on a, off of a dirt road. I can go outside, nature, I can walk. Uh, I did not have some of the problems that some people did. And um, I was careful, but I'm not obsessive either. That's the irony of America. We rely on children to raise us. That's our mistake. But we have no, we had no legendary fathers. You know, we had no legendary mothers. We arrived on boats and it was the sick kids that survived. 
And those were the ones that became our forefathers and became America. Like, think about that. We were raised by teenage kids and we still act like it. So for me, if there's no justice with the George Floyd case, there's no justice, period. It was quite, you know, shocking, um, monumental. Um, you know, it was, uh, there was a lot going on in life, my life at that time anyways. My mom was, you know, uh, on a, uh, being needing care and we were all our siblings were all taking care of her that way. So... Um, then also, you know, a, a, a tool for look at the news and just know that. Um, yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.